Hi, fantasy readers. This is Corinne Norton, your fellow book binger, and you are listening to the Finding Fantasy Reads podcast, where you can test out a new fantasy story every single week to find your next favorite author. You'll want to stick around for today's story if you like morally gray characters and bittersweet lessons. It's written by Mood Adel, who is an Egyptian author living in France. His mother tongue is Arabic, and his daily language is French, yet he insists on writing his fantasy stories in English, using Arabic only when writing poems. I find it fascinating that his reasoning is that he can express himself better in English, but yet he also admits that emotions can be described better in Arabic. Regardless, I am thankful he writes in English, because that means I can read it, which means you all now get to hear it. Today's narrator is Peter Franson, host of Christian Geek Central. Stick around to the end or check out today's show notes to see where you can find more from both the author and the narrator, as well as how to enter our newest audiobook giveaway. I also have some podcast news, so be sure to listen to the end. For now, please enjoy Fractured Blade by Mood Adele. A heart ready to stop. A still water surface may mirror its surroundings, yet it can only show a copy of the truth, an image that distorts at the slightest of waves. Such were Rumi's thoughts as his feet clung to the sand at the bottom of a cold spring, his hands clutching the hem of his cyan tunic and raising it to his knees. Standing still, he studied his replica in the water. His short figure appeared taller the scars on his dark skin invisible. Surrounding his image was a halo of blue infused with splashes of an orange hue, the spring's interpretation of the clear sky and the sun departing to the west. Around him, a vast desert stretched in every direction, yet its color bared no representation atop the water's surface. Even the spring obscures the truth. It's my reflection that scares me the most. I thought it would be time— but we have been friends for so long that I can forgive its betrayal, he said to the girl sitting on the shore. She was only a few feet away, yet her likeness didn't make it to the water. Reflection, master? Rumi nodded. He shook a foot and watched the scene warp in the ripples. His resemblance was more accurate like that, a broken man in a disturbed world. For over two centuries, he was one of four illicitums, a watcher entrusted with a secret power that magnified his magic and stopped his aging. He carried the role with pride and protected the continent from the never-ending conflicts of its factions. When time came for new illicitums to ascend, he happily obliged and passed his power to the new generation, accepting his one-year retirement. At first, he appreciated the time, a chance to peacefully experience the beauty of his world, before meeting his demise, a chance that he now wished he didn't get. It didn't matter, though. The year was finally over, and his assassin was already here. He was ready. I'm sorry, master, the girl spoke again, breaking the silence. I still don't understand. Sighing, Rumi glanced at Aira. She wore a white silk suit like the people of Delphia, odd outfit since she was one of the Alicatums who replaced him. She should no longer attribute herself to Delphians. Still, the color contrasted beautifully with her golden hair and sandy skin, while her green eyes and small features added a touch of charm. He liked that she called him master, despite not being his apprentice, but her smile bothered him. Delphians were satyrs. That meant she could see the future and manipulate it. Did she really respect him, or was it just an act? After all, she was going to kill him. It was the final step in her ascension. Foresee my words, Aira. Sate my response and avoid me the trouble. Aira lowered her head. I'm sorry, master, but seeing something through sating isn't the same as hearing it directly. It's true that I would know the answer, but if you didn't voice it, we wouldn't bond. We must exchange emotions if we are to build a connection. Connection, 
Rumi thought. What connection can a prey have with its hunter? Does she not know why she is here? Rumi looked at her strange smile. It gave him a contradicting vibe of deviousness and comfort. Era, you know that you are here to— I'm not ready for it, master, she interrupted. I thought you preferred not to foresee my words. I'd rather you speak them, but some words need to remain unsaid. Sighing, Aira pulled a small bag of red candy from her pocket. She paused, looking at the eye-shaped sweets as if she was contemplating something, then put one in her mouth. Is that Tafan? Rumi asked, his mouth watering. Aira nodded, then slurred with the candy in her mouth. My faction's greatest creation. Rumi agreed and asked for a piece. Aira brought the bag closer to him, but as he put his hand inside, she shook it. He narrowed his eyes, wondering about the shake. He knew enough satyrs to understand that they planned their every action. It was how they manipulated the future. Their smallest moves could start sequences that reformed time itself. Her smile also faded for the first time since she arrived, more evidence that she was planning something, and he wanted to know what it was. Rumi put the candy in his mouth, slurring as he spoke. Shameful how Kala doesn't have Tafan. I've had none since I came home. When I lived in the palace, Milan and I used to buy it by the crates whenever we visited Delphia. He grinned, remembering how he and Milan would split their cargo, then steal from one another. Milan was also a satyr, so that gave him a challenge to enjoy. My bag is full. Just ask whenever you want one. Full bag. Was this another sign? Would she kill him once the bag was empty? Or was he overreacting to a random move? But no, she was going to kill him. He killed the elicitum he replaced a year after his ascension, and now was his time to die. Only the current elicitums could know the secret of the power. He accepted the fate centuries ago, but why was Aira prolonging his execution? He was promised a quick death. Feeling the nectar slowly melt on his tongue, he shook the thoughts away to enjoy the bittersweet taste, thanking Aira in the process. Master, Aira said a moment later, you still didn't tell me about the reflection. Rumi studied his reflection in the water, noting the small wrinkles below his wide eyes and the slight curling of his droopy nose. It had been a year since he started aging again, and even though he looked barely older than the twenty-year-old girl to his side, he still hated it. I got used to my reflection, he said. It reminded me of the man I used to be, the things I could do, but now... The truth is finally revealing itself. Over two centuries of protecting the world, and what do I get for it? My own faction throwing me in one of their side villages, where they put the people who either abandoned their magic or proved themselves useless. Even among those, I'm still unworthy. My reflection in their eyes is even worse than what I see in the water. They look at me as if I am a traitor. Rumi sighed. When they chose me to become an elicitum, they spoke of the heroism, the honor, the added power, and the prolonged life. Yet, none of this was why they sent me to the palace. They thought I would become a pawn and use my abilities for their sake. But I swore an oath. I vowed to protect the entire continent. And that meant, sometimes, fighting against my people. Was I wrong? Era did not reply. Rumi pinched the bridge of his nose. They hate me now, and I can no longer stand seeing it in their eyes. He met Aira's gaze, his shoulders sagging. Complete your mission. Kill me. Do it quickly. Please. No, Aira shook her head, her muscles tensing. You are a hero, master. I won't end your life until you remember this truth. She rose to her feet and presented a hand to Rumi. Come, you need to rest. We will leave at sunrise. And go where? If Kala doesn't know your worth, then I will take you to those who do, so you can see for yourself. It doesn't... Rumi trailed off, falling back to his thoughts. She obviously knew they would go on this journey from the beginning. 
she brought a bag full of his favorite candy and hinted that he would have time to finish it. But if his theory was true, why did she shake the bag when he put his hand inside? A clue? A game? Excitement burst into Rumi's veins. He didn't care about Aira's desire to heal his soul. He had lived for centuries and was ready for his life to end. Yes, the hatred of his people was heavy on his heart, but emotions didn't matter in death. Beating a satyr, however, now that was a game he hadn't played in a while, not since Milan. It would be fun to sabotage the timeline she was building. One last adventure, he thought, grinning and taking Aira's hand. Reflection Rumi and Aira strolled through a single-road village that centered a vast desert. Simple mud-brick houses lined both sides of the road. Some of the residents had set up wooden tables next to their homes, where they displayed a few products for sale. Dates from a nearby oasis, eggs from homegrown chickens, scarves and tunics they wove by hand, and woodcrafted products. Aira glanced around. Everyone says Kala still lives in the Dark Ages, but compared to your main village, this place looks like it never heard of civilization. She turned to Rumi. Does your council punish them because they don't know how to use gate magic? Don't let appearances fool you. The side villages may house the gateless, but they are still important for Kala's structure. One provides life necessities, and the other ensures protection. Neither can exist without the other. But... Let it go, Aira, Rumi interrupted, his voice calm. You still haven't told me your plan. Aira brought her gaze forward, her lips pursed into a line. You don't have a plan, do you? Of course I do, Aira scratched the back of her neck. I will take you around the continent and show you the people you saved. I will prove that our world sees you as a hero, she added, pausing to fidget with the sword pendant on her silver necklace, her voice lowering. And to me, that it's worth saving. Rumi chuckled, ignoring her muttered words. I mean it, master, she quickly added, her brow raised. I can do it. Did you see it? Does the future unfold the way you want it to? Aira said nothing. Do we both find our peace? Rumi asked again. The future can change, master. It's the first lesson my people learn. I will do it. Rumi halted and turned toward Aira, their eyes meeting. She shuffled her feet, as if about to move, but she didn't waver, keeping her stare stable. All right, Rumi said. We'll proceed as you wish, for now. He presented an open palm. Aira inspected it, her lips twisting before recovering the candy bag from her pocket. Rumi reached for a piece but kept his hand inside the bag while meeting her eyes. Sighing and looking away, Aira shook the bag. So I was right, Rumi thought, putting the tafan in his mouth. The shake had a hidden meaning that he planned to figure out. She wouldn't tell him about it, but that made it more intriguing. For now, however, he decided to make a game out of the tafan. Whenever he sabotaged her plan, he would ask her for a piece to treat himself. It would make the challenge more interesting. Where will we go now? he asked. Avaret. There's someone there I would like you to meet. Nodding, Rumi formed a fist with his right hand, but left his thumb straightened. He pushed his thumb toward his chest, but Aira took hold of his hand. Not here, master. Let's move further away from the village. To Rumi, that meant something would happen if he used his magic in that spot, something she didn't want him to see. Grinning, Rumi used his left hand to unfold Aira's grip then proceeded to push his right thumb toward his chest, using it to draw an image of the number three above the location of his heart. He moved his neck in a circle, feeling power course from his heart to his veins, filling each and every cell inside his body. He waved his hand toward the ground, and a large plank of wood materialized atop the sand, its surface large enough to carry him and the Delphian. Before Rumi stepped atop the plank, he caught a glimpse of Aira's frown. Her eyes, however, were elsewhere. He followed her gaze to see four children, their black skin a heavy contrast to their light tunics, 
which they held high at the hems as they ran toward Rumi and Eira. Master, 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 shouted one of the kids, his eyes meeting Rumi's. Are you the Kalangau who will take us to the main village for testing? Rumi shook his head. Mother said he will come next week, another child argued. Then who are you? asked the third one, who stood shorter than the others. And what gate did you use for this? He pointed at the wooden piece. Aira moved closer to Rumi. We need to go, right now. Rumi noticed how Aira focused on the fourth child, a girl who looked to be three or four years older than the boys, perhaps in her tenth year. The girl stood at the back with her arms crossed and her eyes filled with anger. Rumi saw his reflection in her gaze, and his heartbeat tripled. Yet he forced a smile and squatted, meeting the girl's glare. Would you like to step on the wood? he asked her. The boys jumped forward immediately and started running on the plank as if they'd stepped into a playground. The girl remained in place, her expression unchanged. Aira lowered her lips to the level of Rumi's ears. Master, we must... I don't listen to traitors, the girl said. Hey, Aira shouted, positioning herself between the child and Rumi. You will respect your elders. Rumi bit his lips and rose back to his feet, his heart playing a painful rhythm. The girl huffed. He is not my elder. We only obey the council of Kala. Master Rumi is above the council. He is an illicitum, Aira said. Was, said an older woman approaching the children. Our ancestors chose him so he would bring glory to our people, but he betrayed his own faction and fought against it. The woman then turned to the children. Varid, Cove, San, let's go. Your parents are looking for you. The children jumped one more time on the wood, then ran back toward the mud houses. The woman glanced at Rumi and shrugged, then nodded to the girl, and the two followed the young boys. I'm sorry, master, Aira said, turning to Rumi. I didn't want you to see this. Rumi nodded, his heart still aching. This is how the world perceives old illicitums, Aira. There's nothing you can do about it. Maybe some people had false expectations, but you can't believe that everyone in Masteperia hates you just because you were an illicitum. I do. Aira shook her head. I refuse to believe that after I spend the next two centuries protecting the continent, they will hate me for it. Kalangaus are known to be hot-headed anyway. You will see how people really feel about you at our next destination. Rumi sensed a glimmer of doubt in her words, but said nothing. He stood atop the wooden plank and waited for Aira to join him. Evading her sympathetic look and pursed lips, he waved his hand toward the sky and the plank flew upward. When they were high enough, he glanced at the village one more time, sighed, and then waved his hand again, directing the woods southeast toward Averett. The Fantastic Forest Rumi and Aira spent most of their day flying over the continent of Masteperia. The Kalangau sat in the front, his feet dangling off the flying wood as if he was sitting on a tall bench. Despite their high speed, the wind didn't bother him, though he tightened his scarf around his neck and hid its edges. He also raised his tunic to his thighs and tucked it between his legs, revealing a large scar that started at his ankle, wrapped his leg twice, and ended slightly above his knee. Seven more scars spanned his other leg, each signifying a deep cut. Aira sat behind him with her legs crossed in a meditative position. The jacket of her silk suit flapped with the wind, but she didn't give it any attention. Rumi figured she was sating to plan her next move, although he knew she could see the future on the fly, even in the middle of a conversation without the other party noticing. Taking the silent position, however, allowed her to see further in time and investigate multiple timelines to decide on the one she wanted to make a reality. He didn't care, though. No matter what Aira planned, he would sabotage it later. Rumi wondered if he should allow her the chance to prove the world cared about him without interference. Maybe emotions were important in death. They did weigh heavy on his heart. Yet he quickly decided against it. 
playing his game would guarantee him a victory. She would either lift the burden off his soul, or he would have at least enjoyed his last few days. Rumi leaned back and used his elbows to support his weight while gazing at the rising moon. He caught himself thinking that Aira was better than him. He wasn't sure why she bothered with how he felt, but he appreciated the gesture. Below, the desert began to disappear, its dead sand turning to dirt that gave room for grass to grow. Distant trees drew closer and closer, and soon they were flying above a massive forest. "'We are here,' Aira said. Rumi sat up and half-turned, raising one foot to the level of the wood and noticing the wide grin on her face. "'Perhaps we should spend the night outside the fantastic forest. Neither of us is from Avaret. Our sudden arrival in the dark might scare them.' "'Nonsense,' she answered, still smiling. "'It's time they meet their new Illicitum. Without averting her gaze, Aira pointed at a faint light coming from between the trees. There, that is where we need to go. Rumi adjusted their direction. He chose to land a few hundred feet away from where Aira pointed. He expected she would say something against it, but she didn't. Once they were on the ground, Rumi waved his hand at the plank of wood, and it disappeared. He then formed a fist and used his free thumb to draw another three, closing the gate that gave him the magic. Instead of dropping his hand, however, he drew the number five, unlocking a different gate. They aren't dangerous, Aira said. Rumi nodded, but kept the gate open. As the two walked toward the distant light, the old Elicitum kept his eyes forward while the Delphian looked around, turning in a circle, inspecting every tree, plant, and leaf. It's different, Aira said. What is? Rumi asked. The forest. It's different from the ones we have in my faction. Of course it is. Averett's entire landscape is a collection of forests. Yours are more woodlands that surround your cities. True, but that's not it. These plants, they look more alive, their colors are deeper, and the way they integrate with their surroundings, it's like they are a single unit, Eris smiled. I shall spend more time here in the future and explore Averett. Rumi ignored her words and halted in the shadow of a tree. The light was only a few feet away, and he could finally see the place. Tables set in a restaurant-like formation were scattered in an opening between the trees with a canopy of leaves arching overhead. Hundreds of small, glowing bugs flew from one branch to another. Their colors differed, blue, green, red, white, and yellow. Each looked as if it were flying on its own, following a random path, yet every group formed a single color as if moving in unison. Silhouettes of people spread around the tables, their voices loud, filled with laughter, and accompanied by music. Master, Hera called, grabbing Rumi's attention while passing him and continuing toward the Avarettes. When we go inside, I would appreciate it if you let me do the talking. Rumi followed her. It was his first time in Avaret since he left the palace, and he had no idea how they would react to seeing their old Illicitum. Once he passed the last tree bordering the restaurant, the music stopped, and the chatter silenced. They could see him, and he, them. The Avarettes rose to their feet, their gazes focused on Aira and him. The bug light allowed for some darkness, yet he saw the fury in their eyes. Avarettes were large in build, Men and women stood in nothing but simple shorts that allowed their massive muscles to bulge. They wore their hair in braids, though no two Avarettes carried the same style, as if competing to show their character with how they wove their braids. They also had tattoos, every single one of them, always of animals, though sometimes of different species. Aira waved her hand with a smile. We come in peace, she said. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Rumi quickly added. Immediately, every Avaretti took an offensive stance, animals jumping out of their tattoos, erasing their ink and turning to real creatures that stood as high as their masters. Twenty-something Avarettis stood behind their majestic beasts with barred teeth. Thirteen tigers, five apes, and two bears formed a line between their masters and the newcomers. The majestics differed in size and shape, yet all carried at least a single glowing stripe on their bodies. I told you, Rumi said, 
presenting a palm to Aira. He believed she wanted the meeting to go peacefully, so riling them up and bringing them to the brink of fighting was a point in his favor, which earned him a tafan. Grunting, Aira held out her bag of candy. Rumi put his hand inside, waited for her to shake it, then took a piece and put it in his mouth. Enjoying the taste on his lips, he pushed his palms to the side, and two double-edged spears began to materialize in his hand. Majestic Beasts While the Majestics charged, Rumi rotated his spears in the air before leaning one on his shoulder and holding the other to the side. "'I'm the new Illicitum!' Aira shouted. The Majestics instantly halted, their muscles motionless. The silence returned with three of the beasts only inches from Rumi. For a moment, the Avaretis exchanged glances, but Rumi spoke before any of them could. And I am the old one, he said, and the silence vanished. Chaos returned as the creatures continued their attack. Rumi took a step back, swinging both spears. Their tips changed to take the form of a hammer's head just as they landed on the first tiger, pushing the large beast several feet to the side. The second spear slammed against another tiger, sending it away. Rumi's weapons continued to turn, clearing his surroundings from the attackers until a blow landed against a bear with black fur and two stripes across the waist that glowed purple. The bear remained in place, unaffected by the strike. Rumi quickly glanced at the beast, his other spear moving toward a two-headed ape. The second majestic caught the spear and pulled Rumi in its direction. The ape formed a fist with its free hand and moved in for a punch. Rumi used the momentum of the pull and threw his body upward, giving himself a higher altitude while letting go of his weapons. The ape punched the air the same moment Rumi landed on its shoulders, his legs wrapping both heads, his thighs pushing them against one another. The beast was strong, but a wave from Rumi's hand conjured a metal belt around his own legs. Using the strength of the metal around his thighs, Rumi squeezed tighter against the Majestic's two heads. The ape shook, throwing its body left and right while shrieking. The other Majestics moved in a circle around the ape, roaring while their eyes focused on Rumi as if trying to find a chance to attack the Kalangao without hurting their comrade. Rumi created new weapons in his hands, full-on hammers this time, with heads twice the size of his fists. He swung toward any that dared approach. In the rear, the Avaretti themselves began running forward, more creatures coming out of their tattoos. Enough! Aira shouted, forcing another group halt. However, the ape continued to struggle, and a single Avaretti marched forward, tears in her eyes as she pleaded through her sobs. Please don't kill her! Master! Aira shouted again. I won't accept that you hurt any Mastaparian. Rumi waved his hand, and all his creations disintegrated in a cloud of smoke. He pushed on the ape's shoulder and landed back on his feet. The animal staggered and fell to the ground. The Avaretti woman rushed to it. She lifted the creature in her arms, kissed its two heads, then absorbed it back in her body as the animal returned to a tattoo on her skin. With the woman and the beast as one again, she fell closer to the ground and used her hands to support her head as if she were absorbing the Majestic's dizziness. This was so uncalled for, Master, Aira said. Had you listened to me, none of this would have happened. I know, Rumi said, dusting his tunic, but it would have been because you ordered them. This is the world we live in, child. People fear the Illicitums, but wish they could either kill them or become one themselves. It's the truth I finally understood. This is only one group, Master. They don't represent the entire continent— and like you said earlier, our night arrival scared them. Yet they only attacked me. Rumi lowered next to the Avaretti woman and put his hand on her shoulder. I'm sorry, he said. I would never have killed your majestic. The woman said nothing but shot him a look that screamed hatred, and he instantly jumped back to his feet. Please, we mean you no harm. Aira said in a loud voice to the Avarettis who remained standing, their majestics returning to tattoo form. All we seek is a boy by the name of Makanza. No one answered, 
but a young man who was clearly in his last teen years walked forward, two majestic tattoos covering his body. That would be me, the teen said. Aira approached an empty table and put a couple of fallen chairs back in place. Come, Makanza, all I want is an answer to some questions, I promise. The young man nodded. He walked toward her with careful steps and a stiff posture, but his eyes showed no fear. Rumi walked to Aira's side. Who's this? he asked. The one that will prove you were a true hero, she said, handing Rumi a piece of Tafan. Rumi took the candy with a smile. Aira understood his game. The Enemies We Love Rumi sat next to Aira, studying the boy who stood on the other side of the wooden table. A vine that he tied in a knot at the side of his waist held his dark green shorts in place. His chest was bare like every other Avaretti, bronze and bulging with muscles. A tattoo of a tiger started at his neck, wrapped around his shoulder, and ended in his back. Another tattoo of a snake enveloped the lower half of his arm. He'd woven his hair into three braids that interlocked into one another, leaving two to come to a peak at the top like horns. Sit, Makanza, Aira pointed at a toppled chair. While the boy followed the Alicatum's order, Rumi glanced around at their surroundings. The other Avaretis had already taken back their seats, though their eyes still focused on him with the same hateful expression he'd gotten used to seeing lately. Above, the glowing bugs continued to fly between the branches in their pattern of organized chaos. Tell me, Makanza, Aira started again, what is the story your mother told you every night before you went to sleep? The boy's eyes widened. I... Don't be afraid, Makanza. Just tell me the tale, and we will leave your faction, both of us. Makanza's jaw dropped as if at a loss for words, but when a hand landed on his shoulder, he relaxed. Rumi, the newcomer said in a soft tone, his eyes narrowed. He stood tall with a buffed-up chest. His physique contradicted the wrinkles on his face. His head was nearly bald except for a few strands he'd woven into a single white braid. His bronze skin carried the tattoos of nine majestics within a wide range of species, their ink nearly hiding his many scars. "'What dark wind brought you to us?' the man asked. "'That dark wind would be me, tribe Elder Tabek,' Aira said, stressing his name. "'I mean you no disrespect, Ilicatum,' Tabek bowed his head. "'But I was talking with the man.' Rumi smiled and put his hand on Aira's arm before she spoke again. I didn't know you still lived, Tabek. Time must have been kind to you. Though not to my face, I must admit. That one has always been ugly, old friend. Can't argue with that. Old friend, Aira raised her brow. You know what, Makanza, you can go now. I will ask for you later. The boy jumped out of his chair as Aira turned to Tebek. Would you care to join us, Elder? Tebek took Makanza's seat, then raised an arm and snapped his fingers. A young boy approached, and Tebek asked for a round of drinks, a simple request that breathed life back into the place. Other Avaretis returned to their earlier conversations, their laughter quickly rising as the music once again played in the background. I must apologize for the earlier attack, the Avaretti man said. My people don't like seeing Kalangaus in their forest. It boils their blood. Apology accepted, Rumi nodded. Elder Tebek, Aira started, can I ask, how did you and Master Rumi meet? Ask me, Tebek laughed, slightly raising his head. You are an Elicatum now, child. You order, and if we don't listen, you punish. This is the second time I have been called child today. I will have you know that I am twenty. Both men laughed, and Tebek started again. I'm a hundred and nine, Illicatum. My grandchildren have children who are older than you. Rumi here is more than twice my age, despite that young face of his. You will always be a child to us. Fine. Aira leaned back in her chair, folding her arms. Would you answer my question at least? Tebek nodded. 
I was six when it happened. I had just captured my first majestic, a baby tiger. I took him for a run to get acquainted with my body and get used to my commands. Unfortunately for me, I ran into a group of Lunardis who tried to sneak into our forest. It was obvious that our meeting startled them as much as it scared me. I tried to run, of course, but was no match to their flying devices. After they caught me, they spent hours debating what to do with me, hours that I was thankful for. Even at my young age, I could tell that no matter what they were going to do with me, I would never see my home again. But then... The young boy returned with the drinks on a wooden tray, each large cup filled with thick white liquid covered in foam. One-eyed crocodile milk, they called it. Tebek nodded at the boy and thanked him. Then what, Elder? Aira asked. I arrived, Rumi quickly answered. You didn't just arrive, Tebek said, then turned to Aira. He came from the sky and landed at the center of their circle. He stood tall, uninterested by their technology, as two swords appeared in his hands. It was the first time I'd seen an illicitum in battle, a Kalangau illicitum. In an instant, my fear turned to amazement, and I couldn't stop following his movements with my eyes. The battle didn't last long, of course. They were no match for him. You exaggerate, Tebek. It was a long time ago. Your memory must be failing you. Tebek shook his head. I will never forget that day. It was when I made my first promise. He took a sip of his drink. He made me promise not to tell my people about the encounter. I didn't understand why back then, but I know now. Such a small action could have ignited an entire war between Averet and Lunar. So what you are saying is that you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Master Rumi, and that more lives would have been lost if he didn't force you to make that promise. Not only that day, Tebek added, taking another sip. This man saved my life thirteen times. Aira put her elbow on the table and rested her cheek on her palm. She turned to Rumi with a smile. Thirteen times, master? One could say that you are his hero. Rumi chuckled. That would have been true if I wasn't the reason behind half of his scars. What Tebek failed to mention is that I buried a blade in his body nine times. Once I even hung him upside down outside the palace wall for three days. And I'm thankful for each and every discipline. You could have killed me to stop the wars I helped start, but you always made sure I had another chance at life that I understood the importance of having other factions, even if I disagreed with them. I take it upon myself to teach my children and tribe members that Master Peria is above everything, that we need one another to survive. Rumi lowered his head as a slight warmth flowed in his heart. He returned his gaze to Tebek and nodded, smiling as he saw his reflection in the man's eyes. His new wrinkles seemed to have vanished, what he saw was a man he deeply missed, a man who stood alone, ignoring the danger, fighting for the safety of his people. Yet the smile didn't last. A quick glance at the distant tables reminded Rumi of his place in the world. He was a dead legend that they wished would remain buried. Master, Eris said, grabbing Rumi's attention. He turned to her and saw the bag of Tafan she held close to him. He smiled. Aira had now won twice. Makanza never had a story, did he? This is why the boy looked flushed. She nodded. I'm not a fool, master. Had I said we were going to talk to Elder Tebek, you would have insulted him before he sat down or found a way not to be here. It had to appear natural. She paused, then met his gaze. As if it wasn't part of my plan. Otherwise, I would lose at the game you didn't tell me we were playing. Rumi nodded with a grin and put the candy in his mouth. Fine, he said with a roll of his eyes. I guess that puts us in a tie, then. No, it's three for me, two for you. The game started the moment we met. She grinned, though it felt off. But fear not, our journey is not over yet. Sand Lines 
Once again, Rumi and Aira rested atop the flying plank of wood the Kalangao conjured with his magic. This time, Rumi sat with his legs crossed, his arms resting on his lap, and his chest leaning forward. The light of a rising sun crashed against the side of his face as they flew northeast, but he paid it no attention. Instead, he focused on the desert below and the palace in the distance with its massive stone towers and magnificent dome, a place that he once called home. Looking at it, he couldn't help but think of his own faction, Kala. Could he still call himself a Kalangao? He was born in Kala, grew up among its people, and practiced their magic, but he had only lived there for a little over twenty years. It was nothing compared to the centuries he spent in the palace, yet he couldn't claim to belong to the latter. Not any more. He was Rumi the Kalangao again, and that was how everyone saw him. Master, Aira called as they passed above the palace, and he turned toward her. She was lying on the wooden plank, her feet inches away from him, her head resting against the opposite edge of the wood, her golden hair flying in the wind. How did it feel to be an elicitum? she asked, her gaze focused on the sky. You are one already. Why do you need to ask? I have only been an elicitum for a year, and this is my first real trip in the world since ascending. I mean, she sat up and imitated Rumi's crossed legs. I knew about the respect the title commands, and could really feel its weight when I saw how the Avaretis reacted to my words. But the way people treat you, and the wars they wage against one another, knowing the Illicitums will step in to stop them, doesn't make sense. Even Elder Tebek, a man who saw the extent of your power numerous times, continued to fight against you. Why? What did Delphia teach you about the other factions? Nearly everything. We are an academic group, and studying Master Perius factions is obligatory in our schools. What do you know, then? Aira took a deep breath. I know their geography, history, hierarchy, political behavior, and magical abilities. Yet, not the people. You don't know how a Kalangao feels when they unlock their first magical gate, how Avaretes connect with their majestics, or how a Lunardis uses the seeds on their bodies to control their organs. I'm also sure that none of them understands what it really means to sate. Sating means to look inside the mind's eye and see the future. And it still doesn't make sense, Rumi said. I understand the result, but what is a mind's eye? Is it like an invisible eye? And how do you see that future? Is it a vision? Do you see it the same way you see me? There are many questions that can only be answered through experience. As a result, those who understand one another stay together, which in turn creates borders, both physical and emotional, and borders ignite conflicts. Factions don't fight against the Illicitums, they fight one another, Rumi went on, and if the palace didn't exist, they wouldn't stop until they had destroyed themselves and the entire continent. Rumi narrowed his eyes. Is this what you wanted? To make me admit the importance of Illicitums to our world? In part, yes, Aira nodded. I did think it would help if you remembered the importance of your past to our survival, but the truth is, I can't stop thinking about how right you are. They don't see us as saviors, but punishers. If we didn't have the power we do, they would happily destroy us. She lowered her head. Perhaps we should let them destroy one another. Rumi's eyes widened as he regarded her. You are serious. She didn't respond. Rumi waved his hand, and the plank stopped midair. What are you doing, master? We need to go to Lunar. You agreed to let me lead the journey. Was your plan to make me hear another story about how I saved someone's life? You will love this one, I promise. I believe you, but it wouldn't have worked. You think I don't know I was a hero. I do. I remember every life I saved, but I keep asking myself whether they were worth it or not. However, it's okay for me to wonder about this, because I have already done all I could do. But you... He shook his head. You have a life of protecting ahead of you. 
You can't ask yourself these questions. Master, I... There's only one place that can help the two of us. Rumi waved his hand again, and the wood began flying in the opposite direction. The palace. It's where we must go. Master, no, Aira's face reddened. If we go to the palace and the other Illicitums see you, they will know I didn't complete my mission. They will kill you themselves. Then you need to make sure they don't see me. Master, please. Our journey has nine timelines. In three, you win the game but die disappointed. In four, you die with a happy smile. You like the game, right? Let's just continue with my plan and enjoy your remaining days. What happens in the last two? Rumi asked. The other Illicitums kill you earlier than scheduled. In both timelines? Aira bit her lip, lowering her gaze. I can't sate the end of one. We reach some room, then everything vanishes. Rumi regarded her expressions, reading genuine emotions. Why do you care so much about how I feel, Aira? You will have to kill me either way. Because, she twisted her lips, I hope that when it's my time, my replacement will give me the same treatment. Rumi narrowed his eyes. Perhaps, but that isn't the only reason, is it? Aira lowered her head. I don't like it, she muttered, then said with a raised voice. I was excited to be an Illicitum, but no one told me before the ascension I would need to kill for no reason. The secret must— I understand, Aira interrupted, but that doesn't make it fair. Rumi sighed. I lived longer than any man could, child. I saw the worst of this world, and I have already accepted my fate. Now, if you really wish to please me for your conscience, then let's go to the palace. It's troubling to see you lose your resolve, especially since I know I'm the reason. He smiled. Plus, now that we know the possibilities of your plan, don't you think it would be more engaging to explore the mysterious path? Aira nodded reluctantly. Good, Rumi said, then asked for a Tafan. No, Aira said. I never said the game was over, and since I changed your chosen timeline, I get a point. Aira sighed, but pulled out the bag. Now we are at a draw. The next is for the win, Rumi said, putting the candy in his mouth and steering the wood toward the palace. The Bag of Tafan Rumi and Aira landed just outside the Forbidden Palace, a massive stone structure bordered by four towers, each topped with a small dome. A fifth dome, a much larger one, centered the palace, its color, like the others, a bright gold that glimmered under the sun. The two passed through a metal gate that led to a garden split by a cobblestone path. Master, Aira said as the two walked side by side along the pathway, I agreed to your plan, but once we cross the second entrance, you must abide by my words, or you will die before either of us gets an answer. Rumi nodded. Shortly after that, they reached a stone gate. Aira caught his hand and took a step forward, making sure she stepped inside first. She looked both ways, then continued walking with Rumi at her back. They advanced with slow steps, Aira inspecting every corridor and intersection they passed through. Rumi found himself smiling while following her. Seeing the grey stones of the palace and their dull reflection brought back a sense of belonging and a massive range of memories. He loved this place, even when he hated it. They stepped into a large intersection between four corridors, but once he took his second step, Aira pushed him back with a quick move. Duck, she said, leaning on the edge of two crossed walls. Rumi crouched behind her legs, hiding between the Delphian girl and the wall to her left. Rumi glanced around. There was no way she could hide him well like that. Anyone coming from behind or the front would see him. A moment later, the sound of footsteps came from the other side of the wall. He remained in place as the stranger drew nearer and nearer. Aira, you are back already. Rumi recognized the voice as Amarin, the new Avaretti Illicitum. Rumi had met him when he helped ascend the new Illicitums and passed his power to them. Well, you are back too. 
I assume you took care of your target? Amaran didn't respond aloud, but Rumi imagined he had nodded. Did Rumi give you any trouble? Amaran asked, his steps still getting closer. He was a delight. Lucky you, the Avaretti Illicitum answered, his voice indicating he was only inches away. Rumi's heartbeat doubled, and he brought his thumb to his chest. Perhaps he wasn't ready to die after all. When Amarin continued, however, his voice was already drifting farther away. Milan said he wouldn't go down without a fight. You broke four of my ribs and nearly killed one of my majestics. Good thing he didn't kill you, Aira said. Amarin chuckled, as if finding her words impossible, but continued on his way. Milan is dead, Rumi thought, feeling a slight squeeze in his heart. Genev was probably dead too and he would shortly follow. Did it matter how he felt about his life if it was going to end anyway? No, he told himself. I shook Aira's belief in her destiny. I should have accepted my death like the others and not interfered with the formula our ancestors created. At that moment, the game he was playing with Aira no longer interested him. He decided to put her back on track, and that would be his last act to help his people. Rumi rose to his feet and started walking in the same direction Amarin had gone. Master, what are you doing? Aira asked with a whisper, grabbing his arm. He turned to her. Don't worry, child. I know what I'm doing. She was a child, and even though he had used the word before, this time, he actually saw her as one. No, master. You don't know. I'm the one who can see the future, and if you go this way... You will die quickly. I saw it already. She moved closer to Rumi, her voice still quiet. You want to go to Kalita and ask her for permission to let you in whatever this Hall of the Dead is. But I assure you, you won't get there. Kalita is already suspicious of me since our ascension. She thinks I'm not taking being an Illicitum seriously. She will kill you before you even open your mouth and then blame me for... Not if my death is certain already, Rumi said, interrupting. What? Aira's eyes widened, then seemed to be vacant for a second before she released a sigh. It will work, Rumi said. You just saw it through sating, didn't you? She pursed her lips and sighed again. If we do this, I won't be able to control your time of death as I had planned. I was hoping to give you a week after our journey to settle any final affairs you might have, but... This is my last deed, Aira. It's all I want. She lowered her head, a tear on the edge of her eyes. It's all right, Rumi said, patting her shoulder. I'm not afraid of my reflection anymore. I thought I didn't like their hate, but I was wrong. I have lived with it for centuries. It was how useless they made me feel. Every time they dared to show me their hatred, it reminded me that I was no longer an illicitum, that I could do nothing to protect their world. You changed that, Aira. You showed me that I can still do something, even without my illicitum power. I can save their savior. Aira's tears strolled down her cheeks as she pulled out the bag of Tafan from her pocket. She closed her eyes put her hand inside, and grabbed three more pieces. If you take these, the poison in your body will be complete, and it will start working immediately. Had you digested each on its own, as I planned, it would have taken a week after the last one to kill you. But since you are taking three at the same time, I'm afraid it will accelerate the process. How long? he asked. I don't know. I can't sate beyond the strange room, as I said. Well, Rumi put the Tafan pieces in his mouth. All that matters is that we reach the Hall of the Dead. The Palace of Illicitums While Rumi sucked on the candy, his smile grew wide. Poisonous or not, he still enjoyed the taste. He found himself thankful for dying at the mercy of his favorite sweet, and for Aira being the one sent to kill him. He did suspect some type of poison in the Tafan the first time she offered it to him, 
though admittedly seeing her eating from the same bag threw him off. It was all clear now, though, and he liked Aira even more for sharing the bag with him. The ones she ate were, of course, regular to Fawn. It was why she sometimes shook the bag when he put his hand inside to make sure he picked the right one. With Aira behind him, Rumi walked across the palace corridors with a metal robe that jailed his upper body and secured his hands behind his back. He had conjured the robe earlier with his gate magic. The idea was to show Kalita that he was under Aira's control, and with his hands immobilized, he wouldn't be able to open any magical gate. That, of course, wasn't true since Aira insisted he kept the third gate unlocked in case the future betrayed her, but Kalita didn't need to know that. Aira was the only Illicitum with the power of sating. They entered the throne room together, where the massive dome could be seen at the center of the ceiling, hollow, transparent, and reflecting the sun. On the other side of the hall, Kalita sat on a wooden throne positioned a few steps higher. She was talking with two men, but once she saw Aira, Kalita jumped off the throne and rushed toward her. As she drew closer, Kalita's skin remained pale on her face, but from the neck downward, everything changed. Her leather suit transformed to a blue liquid that enveloped her body. Then the color became black before it solidified again. A gun with a long barrel climbed out of her strange armor, and she instantly drew it. Aira kicked the back of Rumi's knees, and he dropped to the ground the same way she had told him to. Kalita raised her gun, but halted when she saw the Kalangao fall. She looked confused for a moment, but quickly regained her composure. Why is he not dead yet? Kalita asked, eyeing Aira. He is as good as dead, Aira said. The poison in his body will claim his soul soon enough. But he said there was something in the palace we needed to see, so I brought him to you. Aira, Kalita shouted, if you are playing, inspect him. Kalita looked at Aira with narrowed eyes. Grunting, she walked to Rumi, closed her eyes, and put her hand on his cheek. The black armor surrounding her hand changed back to blue liquid before crawling inside Rumi's pores. The two men in the back edged closer. They were Amarin and Rhett, the remaining Illicitums. Amarin had majestic tattoos all over his body like the other Avaretis, Though his were moving atop his skin, their ink constantly changing. Rhett was the new Kalangao Illicitum. He had obsidian skin and a bald head like Rumi. He even wore a similar tunic. He stood a lot taller, however, and with a bulkier body. Yet, when Rumi glanced at him, he looked away. It was clear he didn't like seeing a man from his faction chained like that. I thought you said you took care of him. Amarin said. I did, Aira quickly added, though she evaded meeting his eyes. All right, Kalita said, removing her hand. The poison is already circulating through his body. There's no escaping it. She took a step back, and her entire armor transformed to liquid, then back to a leather suit that stuck to her body, taking the form of ankle-long pants and a sleeveless shirt. Six seeds that glowed in different colors were visible on her body, two on her chest, two on her forehead, and one at the top of each arm. Kalita was an Illicitum like the other three. She represented the faction of Lunar, but during the Ascension Trials, she proved herself the strongest, and that earned her the title of Umholi, leader of the Illicitums and ruler of the palace. What is it you want to show us? Kalita asked, her arms crossed in front of her. Rumi met her eyes. Below the palace, there's a room with a spear stuck to the ground. Take me there. Why? You will see when we reach it? Fine, Kalita turned to Aira. Let him go. I will take him myself. No, Rumi said with a raised voice, speaking words that the Delphia girl told him to say. Aira must come with us. She took away my misery, and I promised to show her the truth. Kalita darted her gaze between Aira and Rumi multiple times. Fine, but Amarin and Rhett must join us too. I don't trust Aira, and that means you too. 
Nodding, Rumi rose to his feet. The retired Elikatum led the other four through a series of corridors, secret doors that clearly surprised them, and a collection of passages that pointed downward. The walk was long, but at its end they reached a stone room. The walls looked exactly like every other part of the palace, gray, dull, and devoid of life. A star painted on the floor occupied nearly half the room, with a spear stuck at its center, tipped down. Kalita moved closer to the weapon and studied it with her gaze. What's so special about this spear? The spear, Rumi said, belonged to a woman by the name of Selinda. She left it here as a reminder. Of what? Aira asked. Rumi looked at her with an uncomfortable expression, then pointed at his chains. Once she dropped them, he took a step forward and lowered his head, pain clutching his heart. He closed his eyes while taking hold of the weapon, and then he vanished. The Fire of Peace Rumi took a deep breath and opened his eyes. Even though he no longer stood inside the palace, the spear remained to his side. Above him, the sky was dark, no clouds, no night. The sky itself appeared black. Around him, a field of sand spread in every direction, its color a mix of yellow, dark brown, and crimson. Massive fires with red flames latched onto the ground, eating into it, adding a reddish light to the atmosphere. Rumi jumped back when he saw Kalita appear next to him with a gun in her hand, but she didn't raise it. She didn't have time. Her eyes widened as they caught the scene. Aira appeared immediately after, followed by Amarin and Rhett. Horror haunted their faces as they turned in a circle. They saw it too. Piles upon piles of bodies stretched across the land, their corpses fueling the never-ending fire. "'What is this?' Kalita shouted, aiming her gun at Rumi. "'Is this a trick of your magic?' Rumi shook his head. "'The future,' Aira said, turning to the Kalangao. "'Is this a future beyond my time limitation?' Rumi shook his head again. "'Then what is it?' the four Illicitums shouted nearly in unison. "'It is what has been, could have been, and can still be,' Rumi finally answered. "'That doesn't make sense, master.' Rumi turned slowly, gazing at the destruction. Bodies lied side by side, damaged to the point it was impossible to guess the origin of each. He completed a full circle and met Aira's gaze. This is a memory that Selinda left for us. To remember what we once did to our world. Master, I still— The Black War, Rumi continued, interrupting. Five centuries ago— a group of scientists found the origin of all magic. They cultivated its essence into a machine that could give its user godlike power. They thought it would unify us, that if we all had the same abilities, we would become one, and our differences would no longer matter. They were wrong. The stench of death grew stronger in Rumi's nose. Every faction wanted control of the device— Independent groups formed in an attempt to seize everything for themselves. For years, war dominated Masteperia. It consumed the entire continent, and everyone died. That can't be, Kalita said. The Black War did nearly wipe us out, but the Order stopped it. They didn't stop it. They merely used the machine to push back time. If that was true and they had that much power, why didn't they reverse time to before the war even started? We needed to remember. This wasn't the first war, and they knew it wasn't going to be the last. The factions always found something to fight over. So the Order used the sorrow to create the Elicitums and establish them as rulers of the continent. After that, they broke the device into ten pieces and entrusted one part to a group of four, one for every faction. That one piece was enough to make them superior to the entire continent. Rumi moved closer to Aira and met her eyes, one hand pointing at a nearby pile of bodies. This is what you protect them from. 
they will hate you because they don't know and because they don't like to be ordered around. But that is the burden you must bear, or Mastoperia will be no more. Tears flowed down Aira's cheeks. Master, I... I had forgotten this truth, but I remember now. Rumi put a hand on Aira's shoulder. Thank you. Aira lowered her head. I understand, she said with a low voice. And I promise you, I will protect their world with everything I have. Good, he said, then turned and started walking between the fallen bodies. Where are you going, master? This is where I belong, Rumi said without turning back. I can take you back to Kala. No need. You go. Touch the spear again, and it will take you back to the palace. As for me... He looked toward the black sky, his voice turning to a murmur. I lived as an elicitum, and I will die as one. Rumi felt pain rise in his body. The poison had started to work. He ignored it, however, the same way he ignored the others. Rumi continued onward, walking among the corpses. There was no reflection here, only his true self. With a smile on his face, he collapsed, his body falling among those who were once dead, those whose children he protected. I hope you enjoyed listening to Fractured Blade by Mood Adele, narrated by Peter Franson of Christian Geek Central. If you want to read more by Mood, go to moodadele.com to find more of his books. He has a brand new book coming out called The Curse in Her Eyes, about a girl who lives in a world that is destroyed and reconstructed every seven days, which already has me asking a million questions that need answering. If you enjoyed listening to Pater narrate the story, you might also enjoy listening to his podcast, Christian Geek Central, where he discusses movies, video games, and all things enjoyed by self-proclaimed geeks from a Christian worldview. This month, we have another giveaway, sponsored by our past and current featured authors. We're giving away a three-month Audible membership, plus four amazing fantasy audiobooks, including Lord of the Rings, The Whole Chronicles of Narnia, Theft of Swords by Michael J. Sullivan, and Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. So you'll want to head over to findingfantasyreads.com slash giveaway to enter. It's open internationally, and I promise I've made it as easy as possible. Now, for the podcast update. Finding Fantasy Reads will be taking a summer break, which means no new full episodes in June or July. I promise we are coming back for Season 2 on August 6th, because we've already started recording the episodes. If it helps alleviate concern about the future of the podcast, this is not a last-minute decision resulting from burnout. It's actually a decision I made last fall, and it started with a decision to take a summer break from all social media. I want to be as present as possible with my kids, and when they're home for the summer, I want to be with them too. So I realized it would be difficult to keep up with the podcast and do justice to the authors I'm featuring if I'm staying off social media, which is how the idea of taking June and July off between seasons was born. I expect to do this every year, and in many ways, I think it will allow the podcast to continue going for longer, because even though I don't feel burnout now, I don't want to this time next year either, and I think having a break every summer will help me come back refreshed and ready to bring you all more fantastic stories. So I hope you see this as a good update, even if it initially sounds like a bummer. If you're worried you'll get out of the habit of checking for new episodes and miss when they start up again, I highly recommend signing up for the newsletter so you can get an email delivered straight to your inbox when they start up again to remind you. And if that's all you need it for, you can unsubscribe after you get that email and then just follow on your podcast app of choice. Now, you may have noticed I said there will be no full episodes in June or July, and that's because there will be one bonus episode in there. I have had so much fun getting to know all these amazing authors, and I wanted to do something to thank them for participating. And because I'm starting to structure the podcast in seasons, I thought it would be fun to celebrate the end of a season with awards. For this first season, we're going to keep it simple with four basic awards. 
Most Played Episode, a Narrator's Choice Award, which will be awarded from both Pater and me, and a Listener's Choice Award, which means I'm going to need your help. As soon as the last episode for this season goes live on May 28th, I will have a Google form available for you all to vote on your favorite episode from this season. It's going to be hard because there will have been 54 episodes by the time we do this vote, but I have faith that you are all opinionated enough to make this happen. Then in June, I will put out a special bonus episode announcing the winners. Because I'm planning this a bit last minute, there is no fancy prize, just bragging rights, and a fun award badge for them to flash around, but I guarantee it will make their day. So if you want to help them celebrate, be sure to keep an ear out for when the voting goes live. I know I've covered a lot of housekeeping in this episode, so be sure to check out the show notes for any links you might need. Thank you all for listening, and happy reading. 